I am tired of marching. I'm tired of the press. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. We already know what the problem is. What is the solution? And true liberation starts with money. Houses going up, gas going up, everything going up. So we need this now. California's first-of-its-kind task force on reparations heard from the public last week. They've spent the last two years trying to figure out what atoning for decades of slavery and racial discrimination might actually look like, including forms of compensation and how it should be distributed. But leaders of the task force won't uh, say they won't take a stance on exactly how much money should be paid. Economists have estimated the total could reach up to $800 billion, more than two times the state budget. The final decision lies with California's legislature. Joining me now is William Darity Jr., a Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy at Duke University, and e. A. Kirsten Mullen, folklorist and founding director of the Arts Consortium, Artifactual. They co-wrote the book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Ms. Mullen, broadly speaking, how vital and important is this question of the price tag, both in terms of getting something passed, but also in, in terms of the message it sends to the community? So we feel that a true reparations program uh, is a program that would be initiated by the federal government. Um, the federal government is really the only entity that has the capacity to pay uh, the reparations debt. Um, we're talking about a debt that was created at the end of the Civil War when the United States government refused, uh, you know, initially uh, agreed and then uh, denied black uh, uh, emancipated individuals those 40 acre land grants, which would have uh, been a tremendous start for them coming out of slavery. Uh, and at the same time, did provide 160 acre land grants to white Americans uh, and, and did fulfill that promise. So the, we're talking about, you know, an opportunity again for the federal government to invest in the wealth accumulation of black Americans when for at least, you know, for two centuries, you know, it has de-invested, de de you know, mm -hmm. de uh, you know, in black, uh, black wealth. So yes, uh, the funds are important. And Dr. You know, not the funds alone, but they mm -hmm. are indeed important. And Dr. Darity, what's the biggest roadblock in terms of making progress? One could imagine there are lots of roadblocks, but is there a, a, a signature one that you focus on? Well, we think that there's actually an improved climate for having a national program for reparations. And that improved climate is uh, recognizable in the fact that in the year 2000, only 4% of white Americans endorsed monetary payments as reparations for black Americans. Today, that figure is closer to 30%. Mm -hmm. And it's moving in the right direction from the standpoint of producing genuine justice in the United States. Uh, in fact, we think that one of the reasons you have this vocal opposition to, uh, to the content of what is being taught in our schools, uh, the so-called, the opposition to so-called critical race theory is precisely because as Americans learn more and more about the history of atrocities in the United States, an accurate history of those atrocities, they are more inclined to say that reparations for black American descendants of U.S. slavery is an appropriate step that the nation ought to take. Ms. Mullen, uh, let me ask you about those those numbers. Um, that Thirty percent now um, is an improvement um, in in approaching this issue. But a lot of politicians um, on the Democratic side say, "Well, they'd like to study the idea of reparations." If you take the, do you take them at their word, or do you think there's a lack of bravery? And if you do take them at their word, is there a central question that politicians, that Americans, are wrestling with this question? really need to face uh, that's at the heart of this question? I think the, the, the central question is admitting that the United States government is the responsible party, that the U.S. government created the racial wealth gap, which we know is about uh, $14 trillion uh, on the low end. Uh, between the, uh, when, you're talking, when you're comparing white households' wealth and black households' wealth, you're looking at a difference of about $850,000 per household. 
Uh, the federal government is the capable party and it's the culpable party. And therefore the federal government is responsible for paying the debt. But it's also the only entity that has the capacity to pay the debt. Um, when you're thinking about the budgets of, I think there are what, 100 and, almost 100,000 cities and towns in the United States, uh, and their total budgets plus those of all of the states is just under $5 trillion. They don't have the capacity to pay uh, this, this, uh, this debt. They don't have the capacity to eliminate the racial wealth gap. Only the federal government can do that. But we also say the federal government is the culpable party mm -hmm. because the federal government, as I said, initially failed to create a nest egg uh, for uh, the newly emancipated black people, you know, basically refusing to give them what they needed to become full citizens of the United States at the same time that they granted this opportunity to white Americans. We know mm -hmm. that 1.5 million white households took advantage of that Homestead Act in 1862. That translates to 45 million living white Americans who are still benefiting from this single government policy, the Homestead Act of 1862. So, you know, in the um, in the 19th century, the federal government was helping white Americans become wealthy uh, through the acquisition of land. When you move to the 20th century, the federal government is assisting white Americans chiefly through the, the uh, acquisition of homes yeah. and businesses and farms through the GI Bill. Uh, right. But black Americans were, you know, were, were pushed out. You know, the black Americans were not, hey. uh, you know, part of that process. Sorry, we've run out of time. William Darity Jr. and A. Kirsten Mullen, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thanks for having us.